Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 174. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. Between writing notes, filing insurance claims, and scheduling with clients, it can be hard to stay organized. That's why I recommend Therapy Notes. Their easy to use platform lets you manage your practice securely and efficiently. Visit therapynotes.com to get two free months of Therapy Notes today. Just use the promo code TherapyChat when you sign up for a free trial at therapynotes.com. Today's episode is also sponsored by This Jungian Life Podcast. I want to tell you about a podcast that I've recently discovered and am loving. This Jungian Life is a lively conversational podcast with three Jungian analysts who explore a wide variety of topics from a depth psychological perspective. They also select a listener's dream for interpretation. I'm secretly plotting how I'm going to get some dreams of myself and people in my family to them to interpret. I don't know. We'll see what happens. It's how they think as well as what they think about, which is almost everything that makes the show totally worth checking out on your favorite podcast app or at thisjungianlife.com. Therapy Chat Podcast wouldn't exist without the support of its listeners. If you'd like to become a member please go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. By making a $1 per month donation, you can help therapy chat keep going over the long haul. Thank you for your support. Hi, welcome back to therapy chat. Today, I have a fascinating guest to speak with, and I can't wait to share our conversation with you. But I have to warn you, we just started scratching the surface when we ran out of time and we needed to plan for a part two. So that's in the works. So I hope you'll be inspired by what you hear me talking about with my guest, Susan Roberts today, and know that we're going to have a second interview that's going to go more in depth. In fact, before I tell you more about Susan, I want to let you know that I'm also going to be recording a second interview with Dr. Daniel Brown, who was on a couple weeks ago talking about attachment. And The sound wasn't too great on that episode and the subjects that he discussed were so comprehensive. I have a million more questions for him and I welcome you to send in your questions. Maybe I will ask Dr. Brown your question. You can give your question to me through SpeakPipe on therapychatpodcast.com using the SpeakPipe button there, or you can email me at therapychat.podcast at gmail.com. Please do, and I will consider asking him about what you want to know about. So look for that coming up soon. And in the meantime, today I'm talking with Susan Roberts, who is an author, lecturer, nutritionist, and occupational therapist with four decades of practice working with people of all ages using manual therapies, sensory integration, nutrition, and healing rituals. Her latest book, Sustainable Health, Simple Habits to Transform Your Life, integrates all of these areas to help people take charge of their health and happiness using the five occupations of eating, playing, sleeping, working, and loving to radically transform health. Susan is a very accomplished and fascinating person, and I can't wait for you to hear our conversation and her unique perspective. And listen all the way to the end because we have a giveaway. She's giving away one free audiobook of her her new book, and it's fabulous. So that is a listener participation opportunity. So let's dive right into my conversation with Susan L. Roberts. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today, I am really excited to be bringing you a conversation with someone who has a fascinating perspective on her work, one that I've never heard before. My guest today is Susan Roberts, OTRL. 
Susan, thank you so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. And you have a book out called Sustainable Health that I'm really eager to talk with you about. But before we even dig into that, how about let's just start off with you telling our audience about yourself and your work. Well, I got interested in occupational therapy about mm, four decades or more ago um, when I went to work at a Easter Seals camp in Rome, Maine called Pine Tree Camp. And I fell in love with the kids and I got myself into Boston University and into the occupational therapy program there and studied there and graduated and then, you know, started working. And after I'd been in practice, I don't know, about five years, I moved to Tucson, Arizona, and I became aware of alternative healers there. There was a stronger, you know, or more openness to that out west than there it was in the east. And also, there were a lot of indigenous healers in the area working, both um, those who were working in the Tawana Autumn Yaki and Pima Nations in the Tucson metro area, and also the curanderas that came up from the Mexican tradition. And I realized that they were doing something that sounded a lot like sensory integration. They were doing a lot of really body, body mind kinds of things, a lot of sensory dense rituals. And it sounded a lot like OT to me. So I thought, wow, I'd like to look more into the these, you know, healing rituals. And I, so there wasn't really any programs for that. So I ended up at Harvard Divinity School where I had about three years to really explore that topic. I had a lot of really good um, faculty members who were encouraging. There was not any functional medicine or integrative medicine at that time. So pretty much indigenous healers were considered superstition, if anything, within the medical community. I now realize looking, you know, because I can see who's on PBS talking about neuro, um, neurobiology or um, the neurobiology of belief, the Goldman and, and Davidson who came out with a book on altered traits 2017. Um, they were there. They were doing this kind of work, but they were doing it, uh, calling it attention, at, not meditation at that time. So there were a lot of people who were looking at some of the same things I was looking at, but everybody was very quiet about what they were doing. And what what time frame was that? It was the early 80s. Okay. The early 80s. And so that field just took off. Um, Mind, body, spirit, medicine, uh, energy medicine, functional medicine, integrative medicine, all those kinds of things just really took off with the science of, you know, epigenetics and um, psychoneuroimmunology and all the different things that have come out since then. It's I always say that the science caught up to the to the traditions. They you know were operating for you know thousands of years and quite successfully based on intuitive practices and based also on what was handed down, what they observed, and the two practices that uh, left a written record are Ayurveda from India. So we get yoga. And the chakra system that comes out of the Ayurvedic tradition, which is about 5,000, has about 5,000 years of oral tradition and 2,500 years of written documentation. And the same thing is true for traditional Chinese medicine also goes back. They, you know, they count back to 5,000 years, but they have 2,500 years of written documentation, basically. So they're very old traditions and they've been, been very successful. And now, of course, acupuncture, Reiki, yoga, meditation are all acceptable within the Qigong, uh, another practice. Um, They are all acceptable within medical practice. And in fact, even insurance companies pay for them sometimes. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they moved into mainstream, but the yoga, Reiki, the acupuncture, they're all like treatment modality within a tradition so that you can sort of take that treatment modality and cherry pick it out of that, drop it into Western medicine, and it still works. Classic Western medica- medical perspective to just go, yeah, what do we, what's the technique and how do we use it to treat yeah. a symptom? 
Yeah, just give us the list of meridian points and we'll be happy. Yeah. But when you go back and understand the the theory and the the you know the history behind it, the particularly the theory, it it opens up many more doorways and especially because they've always been integrative practices. I I find when I do continuing education, which I do now primarily, I find that therapists just eat this stuff up because, you know, for and, and even physicians that the the pra, the you know, the discipline of one pathogen, one cure, that sort of linear progression that um, still dominates Western medicine is no longer really successful even for physicians. Uh, for those of us who didn't get access to uh, pharmaceuticals, surgery, radiation, all the high tech stuff that they use, um, we've always worked with senses. We've always worked with uh, emotions. We've always worked with practical, like daily living kinds of things. And so, uh, when we can take a look at a theory that supports the integrative approach that we've always used, it's really nice. So. Oftentimes with sensory integration, for instance, in occupational therapy, we find that, you know, you learn a technique and it works great for the first three kids that you use it with other people that you use it with. I work mostly in pediatrics. It works first with, the, you know, great with the first three, not so good with the fourth one. And it's a total failure with the fifth one. And, you know, like you don't have a paradigm provided by Western medicine mm-hmm. to understand that. But as soon as you move into five element theory and uh, traditional Chinese medicine, Um, which is what I've studied more of than the Ayurvedic tradition, but it also provides this kind of thing where you can say, oh, that's why, you know, this is, you know, a metal problem or a metal person and they're going to do better with this approach, you know, a a fire approach or they're going to, you know, work better with a different approach. And uh, that's kind of maybe getting a little technical here, but for instance, like ADHD kids, a lot of ADHD kids have wood energy. Not all of them, but all of them have a little bit. And in fact, the guy I study with, Dr. Grandmaster Dr. Nan Lu, he he always says it's modern day liver stress disorder, and liver is associated with with wood energy. But it's that hyper stressed kind of energy, and so you can uh, oftentimes. It's very helpful to get them moving, to get them to use uh, strategies that that build on wood energy or that will um, sometimes calm it down with a little water energy, you know, techniques, Um, metal kind of, you know, like any plant that's taking over the world, you know, you give it a little pruning, it works better. Uh, So some metal techniques. But if you're working with a child who may be hyper, maybe present like they have, you know, some of these ADHD qualities, but they're really more fire energy and you give them a lot of wood treatment strategies, you have just fed the fire and they're the next thing you know, they're in giggles and, you know, silly and bouncing around the room like you've never seen before so that, you know, the trampoline doesn't work for them in the same way it works for a child who's more wood energy. So I don't know if I lost you and everyone else on that. but <laughs> Well, I think what you're doing for me, at least, is super tantalizing me by first blowing my mind and then making me say, I know this is not how all occupational therapists are practicing. So I want to it's true. <laughs> I want to ask you to just sort of maybe take a step back for a second. And since I'm a mental health therapist and I'd say the majority of the people who listen to this podcast, certainly not all, are mental health therapists, but there are all types of other helping professionals and non-professionals who listen. But anyone who's listening, I think, has the opportunity to be kind of curious and inspired by what you're saying. But I, I'll i be honest, I only recently in the past few years really, and I can't say I fully understand, but I began to fully understand what occupational therapists do because if you're not using one yourself or for your child you really don't come into contact with them much in in my work so can can you give me some kind of explanation about like what's the perspective that occupational therapists use in general and then how have you changed that to fit with the five elements and and TCM that you 
incorporate? Well, we, um, so occupational therapy has always been about occupation, but we look at occupation in a broader way than most um, people. We think of occupation as basically anything that uh, occupies your time. Oh. And so it can be anything. And one of the neat things in it, this happened after I went to Harvard Divinity School, but we always looked at four domains. We looked at work, play, um, self-care, and our, or the physics, physics, mind, body kinds of stuff. And they added spirituality as one of the domains for occupational therapy back in the um, late 80s, early 90s. Mm. It became part of an accepted domain of practice so that it's become... Um, in Canada and some other countries, they've really gone out, full out with it and really built up that notion of mind, body, spirit, you know, connecting that, the spiritual side of things. Not as much in this country as, as in Canada and some other countries, but there are many, there are some basic occupations that we work with in any of the people that we work with, we may take a look at. We may take a look at sleep. We may take a look at, you know, are you feeding yourself? Are you dressing yourself? Are you able to stay clean? You know, how's the elimination working for you? You know, in terms of using um, the bathroom, the toilet, we can look at, you know, spiritual connections, family, social connections, all those kinds of things are occupations. And so what I did when I started looking at five element theory from traditional Chinese medicine, and one day I just sort of thought to myself, I wonder what it'd be like to work for Dr. Liu, for instance, or another traditional Chinese medicine practitioner, as opposed to Western medicine, like how would that change my occupational therapy practice? And immediately I realized that it would, um, first of all, I w wouldn't have to work under a physician. I could on my own, but I, I already had a really wonderfully integrated uh, way to look at occupations. So I started taking a look at some of the what's associated. So in, in traditional Chinese medicine, they, they look um, at five organ systems and they look and they associate each one of those with five of the natural elements. And so if you look, understand how the natural elements of wood, fire, earth, metal, and, and um, water work, if you understand those five elements and you understand how that that energy of that natural element affects those organ systems, you then, that's sort of the key. So I looked at, for instance, the earth element is associated with the stomach and with the spleen. So obviously that was a really easy one. So eating clearly went in that domain. I looked at the heart and uh, that's the fire element that obviously is about social relationships and what I call in loving, I, I you know, for to have a, a four letter word, I chose love. So it's eat, love, play is stress relieving. And also it's the primary occupation of childhood. So play is, again, uh, really important, but it's also a stress reliever for adults. Uh, it's learning for children and stress relief. But for adults, that still is important. And uh, that would be the wood element. And then the metal element is that repetitive practice coordinated uh, work. And that is associated with the lung and large intestine. And then the last element, water, um, is associated with the kidneys. And that is associated with uh, sleep in, in, you know, as I, so I picked five occupations, work, play, eat, sleep, love, and those then I associate with that. So if somebody comes to me and they have, um, you know, I, for instance, a child, they're having eating issues. You know, I can, in addition to looking at developmentally where they're at and oral motor and those kinds of things, I can also take a look at, you know, how are they getting along? You know, are they eating solo? Or are they eating with, you know, with other people? What happens when they eat, you know, in a mealtime situation as opposed to a solo situation, which is what often happens to kids who have eating issues. They get, you know, sort of sat by themselves, eat, 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 people say to them. Uh, so when I teach workshops about mealtimes, I'm looking not just at the oral motor, not just at some of the sensory things, but, you know, is the family eating together? Is the child getting outside 
to play outside to develop an appetite. Is that happening? Is there, uh, what's sleep look like? What does, you know, kinds of calming activities might be going on or not going on as the case may be? Are they engaged in the, the work of, of preparing food and cleaning up and that kind of stuff? So all of those areas figure in and, it, and until you look at all of them, you're not going to get any traction in terms of the what changes in what they eat at the table. Wow. We usually do not look at it in that much depth. No. But when we do that, and it's really fun, I love, I'm going to be teaching a two-day uh, seminar up in Chicago for education resources uh, next weekend. And one of the things that's really fun for me is to have practitioners realize, you know, because they're so stuck with some of these kids and all of a sudden they see all the possibilities of ways and ways they can approach this and these children. So we look at it developmentally, but I also have them look at it um, using some of the tools I developed uh, for the book as well from the five elements so they can find out, you know, where, you know, where the child's, you know, may be stuck, where they may be deficient in, in these of the five, you know, five elements. And, and how they can provide um, either, you know, encourage or motivate the stuck energy and move it along or, or help plenish and nurture the deficient energies. And that's all comes from traditional Chinese medicine. That's the approach. There's a wonderful pediatrician, too, uh, Dr. Stephen Cowan, who actually wrote a, you know, um, um, what are they? The, yeah, he wrote the review on the back cover for me. And uh, he has a wonderful website called Turnisol, T-O-U-R-N-E-S-O-L, kids.org. And he does a wonderful thing about the five powers that, that everyone has. Again, it's the, the, five, the five elements. And every now and then, and when I see him at conferences and stuff, we talk and he says, we should teach together, which would be a dream come true for me. It would be really fun. He's got a real depth of knowledge. And, a, and then, you know, because he's approaching it as a pediatrician, as a physician, he brings that paradigm along with the fact that he's studied traditional Chinese medicine in China and, and you know, for many decades. And his specialty is working with kids with autism and ADHD. How interesting. You know, I have a friend who's an occupational therapy assistant and she actually, it was completely random, but I went with her to a a sangha that she's a part of and she Mm. happened to be leading it that day and she led the sangha in a Qigong practice and she explained Mm. that the Qigong practices that she was teaching are parallel to what happens in occupational therapy. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that that's when I got curious. <laughs> that's when I was like, I'm good. Whoa. Wow. Because, yeah. you know, it's like it's, everything is so separate. And when you see how traditional practices like Chinese medicine and traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda and the limited amount I know about chakras and acupuncture and, you know, how it all fits together with what we know now, what we're learning about neuroscience and mm-hmm. trauma response and, you know, right. the, the mind body connection and the mind body spirit connection and sensing. And it's just all so intertwined, but we have these, you know, dozens of different ways of, you know, Oh, this is the way to work on that. This is the way to address that. And yes. I wish it could all yes. be together. It would be so much richer. Yeah. It is. And I think that, you know, that it really, you know, once you begin using those kinds of paradigms, you, you can, you know, the connection between emotions and physical ailments, you know, it's like somebody comes to you and, you know, they have a diagnosis that they've been given, you know, by a physician, but you're not a physician. So you're not going to really treat that physical diagnosis, but it's such a clue to what to work on. So somebody comes to you and they have, joint issues, if you look at a traditional Chinese medicine paradigm, you know right away that you need to look at fear and how fear is operating in their life because fear is the emotion that's associated with joint issues. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, you know, if they come to you with a, 
diagnosis of diabetes, um, I tend to think of that as more of a, a stomach spleen kind of issue because the sweet is the flavor of the stomach. That's how I've made that connection. Mm. But now I know I need to work on anxiety because anxiety, you know, overthinking and anxiety, those are the issue. Those that's the emotion that tends to be the one that affects that affects the stomach. That's where it shows up. And one of the things that Dr. Lewis taught us many times is that the body never lies. So, it, you know, even if you're not going to be working on that particular physical diagnosis as a therapist of any persuasion, to know that gives you a big clue as to where you might begin unraveling what the root cause of their problems is. And, yes. it, and it, may, it may not be fear. It may be something else that you have to, you know, go down and, and find out. But it may be, you know. But I've worked with multiple people who have lung issues and grief. Yep. Right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it's like, you know, you have this chronic lung problem or chronic lung disease that kind of randomly seems to have happened. And you also have, let's say, when you were five year your parents were killed in a car accident. It's like, yep, connected. Yep, maybe totally, <laughs> totally connected. And I've watched Doctor Louis sometimes does you know in a big group he'll you know take you know any but you know volunteers and you know if somebody stands up and and they'll say well, you know so what are your physical problems? What are your problems? And then you know you could it's just you know like a matter of five or ten minutes he unravels it. You know, and right in front of you know, everybody, you know, it's, it, it, it's all say, you know, when did it start happening? And then what was going on? And, you know, and and he'll, you know, he'll go right after the emotion. And it's usually the emotion is is the real, you know, when he talks about mm-hmm. root cause, I've found that it's usually emotional, but it may not be a um, when I teach it, because it's already, as you say, sort of mind blowing. I teach one to one. So if you have a a wood problem, you, you know, if you have issues with the liver or issues with the gallbladder or issues with sprains and strains, um, it's going to, you know, or, or loss of flexibility in, in movement, you can go right after anger. Oh my gosh. Of course, as I thought of five people I know in my family who have, (laughs) and then you said (laughs) anger, I'm like, oh, there it is. Well, he calls it modern day liver stress disorder. And he basically, we, our joke is always because the liver is associated with the wood energy. And we joke, those of us who study with him, you know, the joke is always, oh, it's always the liver. It's always the liver because that's the one that's associated with that wood energy and anger and stress. And uh, so that's usually involved. That's our U.S. But lifestyle. It, yeah. But it may be that, you you know, do you drill down and you find out actually that trauma, you know, fear may have been what triggered it. Right. So then that means you have to treat the the water energy. You have to treat the fear. Yeah. In the order underlying to, cause in order of the to anger. unravel the anger issues. Yeah. So it doesn't always work directly, but for those of us when we're just starting out, it's easier to say, okay, we've got this problem with the liver or the fl- lack of flexibility and movement, uh, hyperactivity. Let's go after anger. Let's go after when I work with people who, because I have a divinity degree, I also think sometimes I work with ministers and stuff. So in that case, it would be forgiveness, you know, so that's their toolbox. So everybody, all mm-hmm. of us have a toolbox that we bring into our work with people. And what I find so exciting about the five element theory is that leads us so that we know which tools to pull out of the box for which people. Yeah, this is exciting. And everyone who's listening is going to hate me because I have to say that we, we don't have enough time to keep going for now, but I'm definitely, definitely wanting to continue this discussion and have a part two because, you know, we've, barely, barely scratch the surface. And so I have a million more things to ask you on a future date. But for now, let me ask you, is your book only for occupational therapists or who can use your book? I think anybody could use my book. I think and uh, I think that, as I say, anybody, you know, any any practitioner who's working with people, you know, we all have a, a, a set of tools. 
and and the five element theory that I talk about in the book and is certainly available to it to it to anyone you know anyone who's reading it I also tried to write it for people who are and part of this came out of my study with him and and becoming a dragon's way instructor took me into the depth of this but I then pulled out and so the occupations of eating sleeping uh, working playing those are also I mean an occupational therapist can run with them in one way but any practitioner or even if you're reading it for yourself you know where you're having the problems yeah and you know you know where to start you know what kinds of habits uh in the book i focus on habits but it helps you figure out where to start your own journey and and where to help your clients start their journey and what kinds of things that you we you know we all have a way to offer them something so i think it it would be you know any practitioner that's working with clients will will get a lot of insights out of it. But I wrote the book primarily for people to do self-help, you know, so to, to, to reach their own health and, and the, the notion that, and this comes right out of the dragon's way and five element theory is that, that we actually, our default setting is health, not illness, you know, but we've sort of been programmed by our society to think that we have to do a lot of things to stay healthy. When in fact, it's a lot simpler than that. And health is our default setting. We, we, what we have to do is, is listen to our bodies. And, and we don't need a lot of expensive supplements or gym memberships or techno gizmos. There's just a lot of really simple things that we can do that um, support the body in doing what it does best, which is staying healthy. Well, that's encouraging to hear, too. Mm-hmm. And counter to billions of dollars, indus- billion dollar industries, yes. <laughs> billion dollar industries that really have a stake in keeping us focused on sickness instead yes. of focused on what we're, what's healthy. And and I, whenever I hear Dr. Lou work with people, he constantly, you know, um, or with us when he's teaching us, you know, it's like, you know, don't look at it as a sickness, you know, look at, look at the side of it that's healthy, you know, don't look at the. Don't look at the what's wrong. Look at what's right. He actually, and you might when I, <laughs> I don't know if you'll use this or not, but he always talks about you know, you give somebody a rose, but really it's when the dog poops under the rose bush that really makes the rose. But you would never think to give someone you love dog poop. <laughs> he would give them the rose. So he says, don't look at the dog poop. Look at the rose. <laughs> All right. Well, I can see that. Um. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he does <laughs> manure. Well, mm-hmm. Susan. On that note, I do definitely want to come back to this conversation, and I know that some people who are listening are not going to want to wait to hear what we have to say because they're going to want to get your book or get in touch with you or f- find your website or whatever you have going on. So, where can people find? what you're doing. Well, if you go to my website, susanlroberts.com, I have links to the book and to the audio book. Uh, you can also get it on Amazon, which is one of the links that I certainly have. Um, so Amazon has a, a great, you know, they have the it available as a paperback and the Kindle version and also just came out an audio, uh, which is wonderful. The reader is fabulous, Tara Langella. She's very good. And uh, um, I'm enjoying listening to it. And if you get the audio version, there's a, it's a workbook. So there's a lot of worksheets, but you have links with the audio version to the worksheets. Wonderful. So and you were kind enough to give us a free giveaway, uh, us being Therapy Chat, a That's free giveaway right. of one one audio book version. So I'm going to have a contest and I think I'm going to ask our listeners since we do have a part two what they to send in their questions that they want me to ask you and I'll for part two and I'll uh, randomly select one to win the free audiobook and the rest can all buy it because they're gonna love it it's an awesome book yes thank you very much I and when I listen to the audio I think wow that's really (laughs) Oh, I wrote that. (laughs) I love that. That happens with me sometimes when I listen to, you know, someone else will be playing my podcast and I'll walk past and be like, this is fascinating. And then I'm like, oh, that's my voice. 
Oh, of course. <laughs> no wonder I am so interested in it. It's exactly what I would want to ask. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. That's so, great. Susan, thank you so much for being my guest today. And I can't wait to get back to talking for part two. And I will, I will sadly make all of you who are listening wait to hear that, but we'll get it up there as soon as we can. And in the meantime, thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to my interview with Susan Roberts. I know you, like me, are probably frustrated that we didn't have enough time to go as in-depth as we wanted because she has so much interesting knowledge to share. And I can't wait for my opportunity to interview her a second time, which will be happening very soon. In the meantime, if you'd like to win a copy of Susan's book, Sustainable Health, send me an email at therapychat.podcast at gmail.com or go on the Therapy Chat Podcast website, therapychatpodcast.com and leave me a message through SpeakPipe. And if you leave me a message or send me a message by March 31st, 2019, your question may be a part of my next interview with Susan, which will be coming up soon. So I love for you all to participate. Please think about what she's talking about in this discussion today and come up with a question you want me to ask her. As always, I'm so grateful to you for listening to Therapy Chat. Thank you for sharing Therapy Chat with your friends, leaving ratings and reviews and subscribing. And for those of you who support the podcast on Patreon, we really appreciate that too. Until next time, take care. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. Being a therapist in private practice, there is a lot to keep track of. I know for me, as an owner of a group practice now with five clinicians, including myself, I would not be able to manage my practice without my EHR system, and I use Therapy Notes. And we use Therapy Notes for scheduling, billing, and managing all the clinical documentation. If you're a therapist who's thinking about getting an EHR for your practice, I highly recommend Therapy Notes. Get two free months by going to therapynotes.com and using keyword therapy chat. That's therapynotes.com and use the promo code therapy chat. Today's episode is also sponsored by this Jungian Life podcast. I want to tell you about a podcast that I've recently discovered and am loving. This Jungian Life is a lively conversational podcast with three Jungian analysts who explore a wide variety of topics from a depth psychological perspective. They also select a listener's dream for interpretation. I'm secretly plotting how I'm going to get some dreams of myself and people in my family to them to interpret. I don't know. We'll see what happens. It's how they think as well as what they think about which is almost everything that makes the show totally worth checking out on your favorite podcast app or at thisjungianlife.com. Just another reminder that if you'd like to become a member of Therapy Chat, supporting the podcast while receiving fun member perks and being able to communicate with me one-on-one, go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. If every subscriber donated just $1 per month, Therapy Chat would be able to keep going strong indefinitely. Thanks so much for your support. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.